Well, that's Pakistan's own making. Uh, I have seen it happening. Uh, when I was Deputy High Commissioner, you know, the, the, the Taliban arose then and with Pakistan's help. Uh, then they established a government controlling a large part of Afghanistan's territory. Um, until uh, then, you know, 9-11 came and the Americans came back. And Pakistan turned overnight from a supporter of the Taliban to the frontline state in the war against terror. Uh, you know, but that was a that was a a tricky, you know, half-hearted U-turn. Uh, even as they became a frontline state for the Americans, they continued to harbor the, the Taliban, support them, and so on. Eventually, they were victorious. So when you know Pakistanis, even in the 90s, I used to read them. Only three or four. Those days, you know, uh, they thought uh, that they had defeated the mighty Soviet Union. and They had these large number of jihadis at their disposal, whom they could uh, use to have strategic depth in Afghanistan, whom they could use to, uh, you know, create terror in uh, Kashmir, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Welcome to the gist on Stat News Global. I'm Ramananda Sengupta. Our guest today is Ambassador Sharat Sabarwal, former High Commissioner to Pakistan and Ambassador to Uzbekistan. He's a columnist for various newspapers, and he's also the author of India's Pakistan Conundrum, Managing a Complex Relationship, which is a must-have for anybody who's interested in the, in the subcontinent. Thank you so much for joining us today, sir, at such short notice. Thank you. Really appreciate your coming in today. So let me just take it from the top, sir. You know, um, Pakistan has sort of been moving from crisis to crisis ever since independence. How is this particular crisis different? Well, as you know, Pakistan has been a troubled and a troublesome state, a dysfunctional state, uh, almost right from the beginning, from its inception. Now, uh, it faces multiple crises at the moment, uh, three major uh, crises economic crisis, a political crisis, and the rising wave, wave of TTP terror. Mm -hmm. uh, to be sure, all these problems have been there earlier also. The difference now is they are far more intense and far more intractable than before. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll come to each one of those uh, issues separately uh, yes, when sir. we can talk more about them. Yes, sir. You know, today, let's start with the political stuff first. You know, today I heard that, uh, you know, the PMLL uh, president of Punjab, Rana San Sanaullah, Sanaullah, who, yes. uh, who said that, you know, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif will be uh, back in Pakistan on the, on October 21st. And he said he is going to be under protective bail and would surrender to the court after his welcome reception. Now, do you think he would have done that without having some kind of a deal already organized? Um, I would think, you know, he waited for the last chief justice to uh, to retire, Omar Atta Bandial. As you know, that chief mm -hmm. justice was ill-disposed towards, uh, towards the government, Shabazz Sharif government. Uh, right. He tilted very clearly towards Imran Khan. His sympathies were very clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so they waited for uh, Kazi Faiz Isa, the current chief justice, uh, to take right. over. Mm -hmm. That in itself should be some kind of reassurance for them. As you know, Kazi Faiz Isa has uh, uh, some grouse uh, against, against uh, Imran Khan because mm -hmm. Imran Khan's government had filed a reference against uh, him in the Supreme Judicial uh, Council. Uh, okay. So the yeah. expectation probably will be that with Kazi Faiz Isa there, there won't be uh, much of a trouble uh, for, uh, for Nawaz Sharif. Although I must say, Umar Atta Bandial, just before he laid down office, he reopened the cases uh, against uh, politicians, cases which had been closed under a law, law passed by the parliament. He, he declared that law null and void. So all those cases have been reopened, including some against uh, Nawaz Sharif. So he'll have to face those cases. But I think the expectation is that he would get uh, some kind of consideration from the current judicial dispensation. And I would agree with you. Yes, there could have been some signals from the security establishment also. 
because if I recall <laughs> right, I think the current Chief Justice was also, um, uh, uh, I think, against uh, Nawaz Sharif being sort of, uh, you know, penalized for his for the last time when he was actually penalized for not being honest and truthful or whatever. Yes, that, that was a that was a completely uh, a very dubious kind of accountability rushed through uh, by the Supreme Court under the directions of the Chief Justice uh, in a manner uh, and at a speed which is so uncharacteristic of the normal judicial system in Pakistan. So that was dubious accountability. That's quite clear. And uh, I think uh, Qazi Faiz Isa had also given a judgment, uh, which is being talked of these days also, against the role of the army uh, when uh, Tariq al Pakistan, uh, you know, mounted an agitation in Islamabad uh, uh -huh. during the, during the uh, PMLN government. Uh, right. And then, you know, it, it was the army which brokered a deal and they were seen distributing money to the protesters as they left. So that demonstration, uh, that agitation was organized essentially to pressurize the PMLN government and the army played a role there. Now, Azi Faiz Isa had given a decision against that role. And that's uh, why the army then engineered a reference through the Imran Khan government, to the Supreme Judicial Council against Qazi Faiz Isa. So he defended himself. The complaints were against some dealings, uh, you know, money dealings of his uh, wife. And uh, they were able to explain things and the Supreme Court then eventually exonerated him. Uh, but I think that completely is in his mind. I see. So there is something called, the, I think, Supreme Court Practice and Procedure Bill, which sort of aims to curtail the Chief Justice's powers a little. Do you think mm -hmm. that has something to do with this, you know, uh, with uh, Nawaz Sharif's getting some relief? Actually, you know, that was aimed at the previous Chief Justice, Umar Atta Bandiyal. As uh, oh. I said, he, he leaned towards uh, Imran Khan, and uh, he, he gave uh, some decisions, important decisions against Shabash Sharif government. Uh, right. Now, uh, what he was doing was, uh, A, he was exercising his sumo moto power to mm -hmm. take up some cases. B, uh, he was constituting benches of his own liking. You know, he was excluding judges uh, who he thought would not side with him, including those he thought would side with him. So that mm -hmm. law was passed by the parliament to deprive him of those powers. Uh, oh, and it was, it was you know, he, he imposed uh, uh, a sort of a ban on it. And he said it would not become applicable. Uh, that case has been taken up by Kazi Faiz Isa in a full court. All judges he has included mm -hmm. in that case. And I think a hearing took place even today. Uh, now, the idea was not uh, to deprive the Supreme Court of those powers. The idea was to disperse the powers of the Chief Justice to take sumo to notice and to constitute benches. Um, and as I said, it was aimed more at Umar Atta Bandyal. Kazi oh. Faiz Isa, although he has his complaint uh, um, you know, against uh, Imran Khan, although he has, uh, you know, uh, he's expected, uh, you know, to be more favorable to PMLN uh, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and other parties which were with them. Uh, but we'll have to see how he proceeds, uh, you know, as cases come up to him. Because he's also seen as a very upright person. Uh, so whether That's he'll right. go all the way to, you know, uh, defend them or defend Nawaz Sharif, uh, that will become clear in the days to come. But I'm curious, sir, wasn't uh, Nawaz Sharif once uh, sort of kicked out simply because he was trying to get better trade ties with India? Uh, there were various reasons, you know, when he became Prime Minister the third time. Look, he had an uneasy uh, history with the army all along, with his army chiefs. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he fell out with all of them. In one case, then Musharraf mounted a coup against him and he was thrown out of power. When he came to power a third time, he did a few things. Not only the India relationship, which of course the army wasn't uh, uh, happy with whatever he wanted to do, but more importantly, he took up cases against uh, against Musharraf, uh, including a treason case. You know, for the emergency that he had declared in 2006, I think November right. or December 2006, uh, and that was the last thing that the army wanted to see. 
you see, if one one former army chief is punished, uh, it lays open all retired army chiefs to that kind of action. And the fact is, all of them, when they when they are uh, they, when they head the army, they have been going far beyond the limits of the constitution. Each and every one of them. So each one and every one of them can be held up. I think that is something which the army didn't like. And then, of course, Nawaz Sharif's tendency in general to have the upper hand as the civilian elected prime minister over the army. Uh, that is something that he mm -hmm. like. So then Bajwa, you know, along with the chief justice of the Supreme Court, then chief justice, uh, you know, organized this, uh, what I call dubious accountability. And a case was rushed through uh, Nawaz Sharif in the lower court. At a totally at a speed which is totally uncharacteristic of the slow-moving Pakistani judicial system. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, he was disqualified, so he lost power. And then, Chaid Khakan Abbasi continued. You know, he became prime minister. The MLN government right. continued, uh, but then eventually, in 2018, the army turned the, the electoral field completely against PMLN and in favor of Imran Khan and brought Imran Khan mm -hmm. to power. But of course, they fell out with him. That, of course, uh, is a different. Uh, you know, speaking of Imran Khan, now we have so many defections and, you know, um, arrests of top leaders. Like, I mean, I believe Qureshi is also in jail and he's also unknown. Is this the end of the road for Imran Khan and PTI? Um, I, I think uh, for the coming elections, yes. Uh, because uh, Asim Munir. Uh, the current uh, chief of army staff, who is very influential now, actually behind the scenes, he's, he's building a lot of influence uh, on the political uh, process. Uh, he wouldn't like to see Imran Khan come back to power because Imran Khan, when he was prime minister, uh, Asim Munir became DG ISI and Imran Khan moved him out within months, I think four or five months, uh, to bring in uh, someone uh, he was fond of. Uh, you know, so uh, Faz Hamid, uh, who then, of course, you know, wasn't made army chief and, you know, he lost out. He wanted to become right. army chief with the support of Imran Khan. Uh, so Asim Munir wouldn't like uh, him to come back. Uh, he was released in one case, the Tosha Khana case by the high court. But then he was rearrested uh, and continues uh, to be in detention in another case. Uh, mishandling of a classified message received right. from the Pakistan right. embassy in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, so mm -hmm. the army's intentions are quite clear. Uh, most of the senior leaders are in detention. And what they can do is uh, they can make sure that no worthwhile candidate takes up a PTI ticket when the elections come. Uh, right. now, the problem, of course, is that uh, in spite of his being under arrest, he remains very popular. A Gallup mm -hmm. poll which was conducted in June and the results were released, uh, I saw them recently in the Pakistani press, uh, uh, shows his popularity rating at 60% compared to 36% for Nawaz Sharif, who has been the most popular politician in Punjab, the largest province in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's a problem for the army. I did see some reports in the social media. I have no right. confirmation yeah. of that. Where the army may be trying to, uh, to you know, talk to him, bring some more reason in him. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know whether that is true or to what extent they would succeed. Uh, my own uh, feeling is the preponderant possibility uh, is chances are that he will be kept out of the next election. He and uh, maybe not necessarily his party, but they'll make sure that no worthwhile candidate takes their ticket. So the chances right. of success are minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you can't write him for all times to come. Look, prime ministers ousted in the past, whether uh, Benazir or Nawaz Sharif have come back. So what happens in the long run? We don't know. In fact, for all you know, it probably gets them some sympathy to come back the next time. So uh, yes, it depends. It depends. You know, I mean, these generals keep on playing these games. So there is, uh, I can imagine a situation, a future general uh, who is unhappy with the, the parties around and he feels that look this man is now has mellowed down he's learned his lessons uh, he's willing to tow our line and some kind of agreement is struck with him and he comes back uh, right. will that happen we don't know as i said that's very difficult to predict of course in fact i mean in pakistan anyway most things are very difficult to predict you don't know which way it's going
Yeah, you know that. Sir, um, let, let's talk economics, sir. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing that things are quite a mess in economic mm. terms. Mm. They seem to have somehow bailed themselves out of a default. But I think they still owe a lot of money which is going to come up soon for repayment. What mm. happens then? Well, they had the sword of default uh, hanging on them for the last one year or so. Mm-hmm. Until uh, they got uh, a three billion dollars nine month deal from the IMF, uh, right. the idea seems to have been to give them a deal to tide over the elections period, uh, and then the IMF deals with the new government. Now elections right. themselves right. when they take place, that's an uncertainty. Mm-hmm. That has happened. Right. That prevented uh, the the uh, default, and now we hear and there are reports. Uh, that that deal was facilitated by the Americans uh, because Pakistan sold munitions to Ukraine through That's Western right. countries, went through Western That's countries, right. but Pakistan sold munitions to Ukraine. Uh, right. So you know, then the Americans uh, exercised their influence with IMF and ensured that that deal was struck. But as you rightly said, Pakistan has to repay 75 or 76 billion dollars. Over the next three years, repayment of loans right. and so, on. so what can they do? A, they can borrow from the commercial market, where the possibilities are very limited because of Pakistan's macroeconomic situation. Mm-hmm. B, they can, uh, you know, get money from their friends, uh, China, Saudi Arabia, UAE, etc., uh, or ask them to to uh, reschedule repayment of their loans. That they have been doing, but that doesn't solve the problem entirely. And three, they seek uh, restructuring of their entire debt that they may have to do at some stage. Uh, If that doesn't happen, they may default again. But what is certain is that the Pakistan economy will come back time and again to the breaking point as it has been in the past. Mm -hmm. Unless the government takes some structural measures uh, to remedy the problems of the economy. One of them, important one is to tax the rich the managing director of IMF told the caretaker prime minister very recently, you tax, tax the rich. You keep on telling me your poor have problems. You ask me to give you exemptions for that. Tax your rich and help the poor. Now, is Pakistani establishment willing to do that? Pakistani establishment headed by the army. Because all the rich people, whether they are agriculturists, whether they are industrialists, the army businesses, they all get big tax breaks. Are they willing to give them up? So unless Pakistan deals with the structural problems of the and the biggest problem of Pakistan's economy is Pakistan's adversarial attitude towards India. That mm-hmm. imposes very heavy burdens on Pakistan's, unbearable burdens on Pakistan's economy. And the gap is growing and that burden keeps on growing as far as smaller Pakistani economy is concerned. That is mm-hmm. something which is never acknowledged. I see so many articles written by uh, well-meaning Pakistanis on how to improve the economy. They fail to talk of this one particular aspect. So unless Pakistan deals with all these problems, as I said, the economy will uh, keep on coming back to the breaking point time and again, even if there is no default. But if there is a default, that will be a very serious situation. It will bring a lot of hardship to the people and cause further instability in Pakistan. Right, right. Now, you know, you mentioned $75 billion. Is the, you know, the, does that include the money for CPEC and all that stuff that you already owe to China? Yes, it, it's all told that they have to repay. Uh, actually, Chinese debt is only about 25% of the overall debt. Uh, okay. You know, about $130 billion. And Chinese is about 25%. Uh, some of them is long term, some of that is uh, short term. The rest is commercial debt, which is all short term or multilateral institutions or Paris club countries and so on. Uh, mm-hmm. But the next three years, all told, they have to pay 75 to $76 billion. And they just That's don't earn that money. Their exports are not enough, uh, you know, after taking into account imports. Uh, they've been getting about $25 billion or, or so as remittances from Pakistanis working abroad. Mm-hmm. But all these things put together, uh, after taking into account imports, which are also essential, uh, are not enough uh, to to meet those requirements. Mm-hmm. So coming back to the CPEC, I mean, it, it really hasn't met any of the goals of the Chinese that set for itself on CPEC. Is, is that something, you know, what they call too big to fail a thing for China? 
So they will keep on putting uh, something into it. What is clear is uh, this A, uh, uh, the, the uh, CPEC projects have not, uh, not produced the kind of foreign exchange and earnings that would have been expected to meet the debt burden that CPEC has imposed on Pakistan. So that debt burden mm -hmm. has worsened things uh, for Pakistan in terms of its debt, in terms of its repayment capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think, and then there are serious security problems. Chinese nationals and Chinese interests have been attacked in Pakistan. Right. That yeah. remains a very touchy point with the Chinese. There are indications now uh, that the Chinese are becoming more cautious towards new projects proposed by Pakistan under uh, CPEC. Uh, in fact, there was a meeting which took place. Uh, there is a joint uh, committee of the two sides which considers right. CPEC uh, projects, old and new. Mm -hmm. uh, a meeting took place almost last year and joint minutes couldn't be finalized almost for one year. They were issued uh, recently. Just recently. <laughs> very recently. And they show that the Chinese refused to accept a number of projects proposed by the Pakistani. So that tells you that they are becoming cautious. They don't want to sink their money uh, unless you know things improve. Uh, so uh, that is quite clear. Uh, but look, there are two components of uh, CPEC here. One is the route linking Xinjiang to uh, to Gwadar. Right. Now that right. is strategically extremely important for the Chinese. That is a, that is one of the exit routes for the Chinese to the sea, bypassing the maritime choke points in the east, which always remain a matter of worry for them. The Malacca Strait, right. etc. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that route they would maintain at all costs security problems, money, whatever is needed. Uh, the second is, you know, projects, whether in energy or free trade zones or, you know, various other infrastructure projects, the dams, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which were essentially meant to, you know, bring some greater activity in the Pakistani economy, in the economy of an ally of China. Uh, that uh, they may have to reassess and see uh, how it moves forward. Uh, how far that segment succeeds, we don't know. But the route, uh, I'm sure they will uh, they will make every possible effort to make sure that it is sustained. But sir, I mean, you said that they are not willing to invest more. Uh, wouldn't that again impact the growth of the project itself? I mean, if they're not if you're not willing to add more funds into it, that would no, just uh, slow down recovery. No, no, no. I think I, I, I should should correct that impression. Uh, they are continuing with the existing projects okay. which have been accepted. This is the new projects which Pakistan had proposed in various areas, in energy, in infrastructure, various other uh, projects. Right. Uh, many of those projects that did not accept the new projects. Okay. Uh, okay. But they haven't discontinued financing the existing ongoing projects. Oh, okay. And also, as you said, you know, it's a, from uh, the port itself also is the route to the, you know, a sea route, which opens up, as you said, that's also a very big factor for them. That is, that is an important factor. That's one of the exit routes for them to the sea, right. uh, bypassing yeah. the maritime choke points that essentially is potentially also a staging uh, point uh, in Makaran coast for Chinese Navy into the Arabian Sea and beyond. Right. Sir, you know, we've talked about political issues, we talked about the economic issues, which, and economic issues from what little I have heard from my friends there, this time it's pretty bad in the sense that, you know, people are actually digging into their savings to sort of pay for daily, you know, expenses. But um, on top of that, as you, said, as you said, there's terrorism with the TTP sort of stepping up its act. But apart from TTP, earlier you also mentioned Balochistan, you know, Khyber Pakhtunwala, the NWFP, all those areas. How does one resolve that? Because that's also a very, you know, uh, not a good thing on the economy itself or on the political situation. But that's Pakistan's own making. Uh, I have seen it happening. Uh, when I was Deputy High Commissioner, you know, the, the, the Taliban arose then and with Pakistan's help. Uh, then they established a government controlling a large part of Afghanistan's territory. Um, until uh, then, you know, 9-11 came and the Americans came back. And Pakistan turned 
overnight from a supporter of the Taliban to the frontline state in the war against terror. Uh, you know, but that was a that was a a tricky you know half-hearted U-turn. Uh, even as they became a frontline state for the Americans, they continued to harbor the, the Taliban, support them, and so on. Eventually, they were victorious. So when Pakistanis, even in the 90s, I used to read them, only three or four. Those days, you know, uh, they thought uh, that they had defeated the mighty Soviet Union and they had these large number of jihadis at their disposal, whom they could uh, use to have strategic depth in Afghanistan, whom they could use to, uh, you know, create terror in Kashmir, etc., etc. Uh, so very few Pakistanis, but well-meaning Pakistanis even then said, this is a bad card. Please don't use it. And then Pakistanis ensured their victory in 2021 when everyone was saying that they will not cut off their ties with TTP. TTP has fought alongside them. They have ideological affinities. The Taliban also remain worried that if they, they, they start getting tough with the TTP, many of their warriors could go to the Islamic State which is a big problem for them. Uh, so therefore, the Taliban are not going to act against TTP. Pakistan has been asking them to do so. They have tried multiple times. Uh, but uh, the number of attacks, the intensity of attacks has only grown. And I saw a report recently that the number of uh, security personnel killed uh, over the last seven, eight months was the highest in the last eight years for, for a single year. Uh, so the situation is very serious and uh, it's not going to change. It's not going to change because it's, it's a monster that the Pakistanis have created and uh, it's very, very difficult to control it. Mm -hmm. so that monster is the, the political process will have no impact on it. Uh, you know, unless they completely revise their policy, you know, now that uh, I, I don't know if that's possible uh, at the stage at which they have reached. Mm -hmm. They're also having a problem with the Taliban government in Afghanistan. How does one uh, deal with that? No, that's exactly what I told you. They they ensured the victory of Taliban. They helped the victory of Taliban in August mm -hmm. 2001. Right. But you see, uh, any Afghanistan government in Afghanistan, uh, mm -hmm. which gets a foothold there, there are hundreds of issues with Pakistan. Uh, that Afghanistan has, including, you know, transit trade, there are difficulties there. The question of Durand line, which hasn't been recognized by any Afghan government, including the Taliban, they haven't recognized the Durand line. Mm -hmm. uh, so this should have been clear uh, to, to the Pakistanis. Uh, Pakistan as a neighbor of Afghanistan could have been relevant to Afghanistan in many positive ways. Uh, but uh, instead of that, you know, in trying to gain a strategic depth and, you know, have a government of their choice in Afghanistan, they have today created a situation that any government in Kabul will have many problems with them. And that's what is happening with the Taliban. They do have some elements within the Taliban very sympathetic to them. Uh, but overall, they haven't got the kind of response that they were expecting from the Taliban. It's, had, it's mm -hmm. not it's been anything but smooth sailing that they might have expected. I see. So, you know, if Nawaz Sharif comes back and he sort of, you know, becomes, uh, starts the campaign on behalf of the PMNL, what does that mean for Bilawal Bhutto? I think, I think that's going to impact them quite badly because, you know, the PPP as such. Look, they, they PMLN and PPP, they were together in the, in the Shabash Sharif government essentially to counter Imran Khan. Mm -hmm. And now that Imran Khan's uh, challenge has been contained, largely contained, uh, mm -hmm. they are pursuing their own interests. So right. Uh, right. PMLN wants to retain its dominance in the largest province, Punjab. PPP mm -hmm. wants to retain its dominance in Sindh. Uh, but PPP okay. was marginalized in the last two elections completely in Punjab. In PPP would like to regain some seats in Punjab also, especially in southern Punjab where they have been powerful and influential in the past. Now that clashes with the interests of PMLN. Uh, so they are pursuing different interests. Uh, that's quite clear and they will continue to do so. In fact, I may say that the army, which has, uh, you know, which was with uh, these two parties again to counter Imran Khan, uh, is now will pursue its own interests. 
the army won't like any of the major players to get a decisive majority in the next election whenever it takes place they would like to have a splintered uh, parliament a splintered national assembly a hung national assembly where they can create a majority of their own choice with smaller parties uh, which are beholden to them those parties they can manipulate and take them to one side or the other side so they would like to have a hung assembly where they can use those parties to craft a majority of their own choice so some of everyone the is, yeah, yeah. everyone is pursuing uh, his own interest now uh -huh. so some of the splinter groups from the pti i mean they've started off new parties of their own they would also be then yeah. sort of yes. makers at some level look there are uh, three parties old parties uh, older mm -hmm. parties which are there with the army that is uh, pmlq uh, of uh, choudhry shahjat hussain then mqm pakistan which was created by the army and then balochistan awami party the caretaker prime minister belonged to that party he was one of the founders that way, which was again created they were defectors from pmln at the behest of the army who created balochistan awami party so you have three parties there uh, then istekam a pakistan created by sugar baron uh, jahangir tareen uh, who is close to the army and then another party uh, pti parliamentarians created by the former chief uh, chief minister of khyber pakhtunkhwa again right. close to the right. army so the number of parties which the army can manipulate has grown uh, and that may help the army you know uh, in in getting a hung assembly which mm -hmm. so essentially it's still the army always calling the shots nothing else has changed on that part no uh, certainly not i mean you know Uh, when Asim Munir came to uh, became the army chief for some time, he was finding his feet. But uh, post May 9, uh, trouble against the army and you know attacks on army installations instigated by PTI and Imran Khan, he has consolidated his position and he's uh, uh, calling the shots. Uh, the army will need uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, to contain the the. PTI challenge Imran Khan challenge in Punjab because he is the most influential he is the charismatic leader of his party not Shahbaz Sharif right. so the right. army has a dilemma here they need Shab uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, but i don't think they would trust uh, Nawaz Sharif if he were to become a prime minister uh, the prime minister again uh, if <laughs> it comes to a situation where PMLN wins a majority and can form a government the army's choice may be for Shahbaz Sharif Uh, more than Nawaz Sharif has, has been, has been more, more more pliable, and as you might have heard recently, uh, Nawaz Sharif again started talking of a London of accountability against Kamar Javed Bajwa for the right. and, uh, and former chief justices, and then Shabazz had to rush uh, back to London and to convince him uh, to quieten down for the time being. This may not be to the liking of the army. Uh, how long will he stay quiet uh, i don't know knowing him uh, as i do i think he will again try and assert himself if he were in a position to do so and that would not be to the liking of the army so which means i mean as i said nothing really has changed that much in pakistan over the last few years in fact the army if anything has become stronger no it's so uh, it it remains front and center in the calculations of all uh, political players uh it is playing an important role it has got a caretaker government of its own choice uh it was given greater powers uh through a law passed by the parliament uh, you know of search and uh, carrying out investigations and so on uh which it can use against its uh, opponents it has got a much bigger share in the in the economic policy making a special uh, investment facilitation council has been created an army chief is a member of that council along with the prime minister and he's mm -hmm. been talking to groups of businessmen from karachi and lahore recently to reassure them of an economic plan to to improve the economy and he's talking of bringing uh, investment up to 100 billion dollars from gulf countries uh, i don't think anyone is going to throw their money uh, and sink their money in pakistan investment that pakistan can bring even by selling its assets would depend upon its macroeconomic environment the absorption capacity of the economy and the law and order situation all three are bad uh, so you know this is again a mirage being shown by a new army chief to the public which is suffering mm -hmm. uh, 
are because of the economic factors. Uh, uh, similar mirages have been shown by earlier dictators and civilian leaders in the past also. Uh, that's true, sir. Sir, we seem to be sort of running out of time. So let me just ask you a final question. Let's talk about bilateral relations. You know, since the Kashmir thing, we have downgraded relations and everything. Do you see any chance of it sort of going back to at least what it was before the Kashmir thing happened? Look, uh, it, it, you know, Pakistan took a very unreasonable stand. They didn't have an effective answer to that move by India, the 5th of August 2019 move. Uh, so Imran Khan took some steps which uh, were, you know, like uh, cutting your, your nose to spite your face. He suspended trade, for example, which hurts the Pakistani economy more than it hurts the Indian Absolutely. economy. And he also said mm -hmm. there could be no uh, dialogue with India until India withdrew that measure. Now, that's not going to happen. Uh, then we heard of some fallback positions saying if India were to restore statehood to Jammu and Kashmir, to Kashmir uh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and you know, uh, then it may be possible to talk. A statehood would come when it comes. The government of India is committed to it, but it will not come in response to a Pakistani demand. So I think things have to become clear within Pakistan first. Is it going to be an election? Who comes to power? What is the attitude of Asim Munir? We are not very clear about that at the moment. Or as some people say, will the caretaker government stay on a little longer? Uh, it's only when things are stable in Pakistan that something can move forward. Uh, at that time, the Pakistanis, there may be a climb down by the Pakistanis, you know. Uh, they also realize that they are in a, in, they painted themselves into a very tight corner. At that time, you know, uh, there they, some possibilities may reopen uh, to stabilize the relationship and more to add to the ceasefire, uh, which seems to be lasting by and large on the line of control, which was restored in February 2021. Uh, and to mm -hmm. bring back some things uh, of the past which were lost. By that, I mean trade or uh, diplomatic relations at high commissioner's level or, you know, better mm -hmm. communication, transportation facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But that's mm -hmm. not for now. That's not for the immediate. But given that, you know, yeah. moving from crisis to crisis, I don't think that's likely to happen anytime soon now. Uh, no, as I said, uh, things have to become clear in Pakistan. And look, uh, we shouldn't forget, we are also entering our electoral cycle. Of course. Uh, so this is not the moment uh, for any forward movement. Uh, mm -hmm. See, clarity, what happens in Pakistan when we are through with our elections, then we'll have to see and assess the situation. And there may be a climb down from Pakistan, as I said, uh, to facilitate uh, greater stabilization of the relationship. Mm -hmm. So that was a you know very uh, informative kind of a you know, discussion we just had. With that, I think we we'll close it for today because we're running out of time. Thank you so very much for joining us, sir. I mean, I really appreciate again your taking time out, and uh, we'd like to call you again if, if if time permits for you to sort of discuss what happens next. Thank you very much. Once Thank the elections you. are over, definitely we'd like to have you. To tell us what what we can expect next thank you it was a pleasure answering your questions thank, thank you. you sir thank you that was ambassador sharad sabarwal former high commissioner to pakistan and ambassador to uzbekistan who was talking to us about the recent crisis that is plaguing pakistan and how it is different from the earlier crisis which i suppose it really isn't we, i hope you enjoyed this particular episode and you can Show us a little love by clicking on the like, share, and subscribe buttons below. I look forward to seeing you again. Until then, goodbye.